It's another episode of the Emissary Authors podcast featuring Jason Todd, my partner in crime and co-host, and yours truly, Paul Edwards. Jason, great to be with you again, my friend. How are you today? Always a pleasure. I, uh, I appreciate having these conversations, not only from the, from the obvious business aspects of this, but the personal aspects as well, learning so much from our various authors who have been kind enough to share their journeys with us. That's true. And today, uh, we've got something that, uh, dovetails actually very well with a project that we've been working on. Um, uh, but I'm excited to introduce our guest today. We've got, uh, Brian Ahern, uh, a longtime friend, former guest on a previous pod in a previous podcast life, uh, for me. And, uh, he's got a brand new book. This is interesting. His story, my story, our story. And Brian, this is about um, among other things, your experience growing up as the son of a member of uh, the United States Marine Corps and all that goes along with that. So, I mean, that's really what I think we want to start off with is what was that like and, uh, and what brought you into, to, to the point of writing a book about it? Well, first of all, thank you uh, to both of you for having me on. I'm excited to have an opportunity to talk about the book that's coming out. And, and this is the first podcast I've done around this book. So thank you for having me on the show. Um, growing up with a dad who was a Marine, at the time, you don't realize it. You're just a kid and your life is your life. And to you, that's what's ordinary. It's not until I think you get older and you look back and you start questioning certain things and you start realizing certain things too. So I will say this up front, there are so many positives, uh, so many of the traits that I have learned that have helped me succeed come from my dad and, and the discipline and, and the things that he exemplified as a Marine. But there were also a lot of really negative things too. And as I got older and began questioning him about aspects of uh, the failed marriage with my mom and, and other things, he did not like it. <laughs> He, mm -hmm. he did not like being questioned on, on things like that. So we had some really challenging times, but we ultimately were able to get to a really good place. And when he passed about three years ago, I decided I wanted to write a book to honor him and to help Marines and Marine Corps families. Because mm -hmm. I think, I think if Marines read this book and maybe learn from some of the mistakes that my dad made, maybe they'll avoid those mistakes. And if a Marine family reads this book, they might have more empathy and understanding for that person and maybe what they're going through. And, and the goal would be to bring the two together closer. So that was really the, the impetus of the book after his passing. So right away, like, you know, this is, this is a bit of a, of a soft spot for me as an army veteran raising two boys who, um, you know, have frankly, occasionally borne the brunt of the way I learned to do things in the military and the way the, um, the way it shaped me. And, uh, and of course, right. As, as you pointed out, there are habits and traits being passed down that I think will serve them. Well, there's also stuff that I, <laughs> anytime it comes to mind, I immediately cringe and say, Oh no, I shouldn't have done that. Right. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know how I would stack up next to your dad in terms of how open of a discussion I'd, I'd be willing to have. I certainly have made the best efforts I can, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe a good place to start, Brian, is just like, what is it, what do you remember most that you look back and you say, um, you know, the, there was, we, we could have done something differently there. You know, what, what, what comes to mind? Probably when I turned 30 and I really got involved with church and life changed radically for me in a really positive way. And it was around, it was at my 30th birthday, which was taking place over uh, Easter weekend. And so we had invited my dad and my stepmom to come down and, you know, be with me on my birthday, but also stay for church. And, um, my Stepmom said, I don't think your dad's going to want to go. And, I, and she said, you know, you, you may want to talk to him about that. So he and I had this short conversation and, and I said, well, hey, why don't you stay down here with us and, and go to church? And he said, no, I'm, I'm busy. And, 
And he just kept putting me off. And then finally he said, look, I'm at the airport. I got to catch a flight. If you want to talk about it, call me tomorrow. Well, he didn't think I would, but I called him and I started pressing him like, why won't you go to church with us? And he ended up blowing up and, and saying, look, I don't give a GD what you or anybody else says. I'm a good person. And I mm. said, I've never said you weren't. And, and then he said, look, I don't like the way this conversation's going. And I said, well, dad, it's another thing we've got to talk about. Life doesn't always go. And he hung up on me. Mm. Well, that was the moment that everything changed in our relationship because it was as if all the stuff I knew that had happened between he and, and my mom fell from my head to my heart. And I was like in a rage. I was, and he lived about an hour away at that time. And, and all my thought was just get in the car, drive to his place and tear him limb from limb. Mm. And I'll tell you at, at that time, I had been a competitive bodybuilder for a while and a power lifter. And so I was much bigger and stronger than him. But truthfully, I think he would have kicked my, you know what, up and down and sideways. But I, it, it flipped a switch in me to where I couldn't go back and just accept the norm. I, there was things that needed to be talked about. What I would have changed, I think, was I, I might not have pressed as hard as I did. I, I think looking back, if, if I could have reflected a little bit more and had a little more grace in those times, he might have been a little more open. And I wasn't, I wasn't being mean or belligerent or anything, but I was just, uh, when I want to do something, I just go straight ahead. And so I wasn't yeah. about to let it go. And sometimes you need to step back and take a breather. So that would probably be the thing I would change is my approach. But again, when you're 30 years old, um, and you've just been inflamed by this relationship, it's really hard to step back and, and kind of get your bearings. And I'll be 60 soon, so I've lived a whole lifetime since then, and, and my perspective on things are, are very different. And, and I would hope, again, that somebody listening to this podcast or reading the book might be able to maybe avoid a mistake that I made in terms of how I was approaching things so, um, so diligently. Yeah. I'm hearing... Um... Well, what, what it sounds like, I should say, is that you're digging into the details that for, for a long period of time, you just sort of took them as they came, but then you reached a point where those things started to matter because what you were seeing on the outside didn't match the expectations you had or the hopes you had, and there really wasn't an explanation why. Mm -hmm. there was just matter of fact, that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. Um, I will tell you as a kid, I, growing up, I admired, I remember, and I put this in the book that I'm eight years old, I think, and we're living in California. My dad had only been out of the service not too long. And he was playing pickup football on a beach with a bunch of college kids. And so he might've been 30 at the time. And I remember distinctly somebody saying, man, you should try out for the Rams because he was so intense uh, about how he was playing that game. And, and I loved football. And so I was like, so proud. And, and when I would hear him talk about things because he was, he traveled the world and he was really educated, incredibly smart. Uh, I would sometimes think as, as a kid, like, gosh, why doesn't he run for president? You know, think he can be president. And, and so I had this, this great admiration for him. And even when my parents' mar marriage fell apart, it still, it didn't really taint my view of him. And yet I knew these things again in my head. And, and my sister had a very different recollection. She remembered a lot more things than I did. And, and that really skewed her relationship with him. But for whatever reason, up until about that 30th birthday, it just didn't affect me. And then suddenly, like I said, it dropped from the head to the heart. And, and I knew I couldn't let that go. And when you talk about expectations, it wasn't just about being disappointed with him. I started to realize, you know what? I need to understand him if I'm going to understand myself because mm -hmm. I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to be, I wasn't a father at the time, but when the time came, I wanted to be the best father I could be. I wanted to be the best friend and, and, there's so much that we get from our parents and most people don't even think about why am I the way I am? Well, I wanted to understand that. And, and I felt like he held a lot of the keys and, and that's why I really was, was pressing in. Yeah. There's a, um, this takes me back actually to our, the last time you and I were on a podcast together, um, 
because I remember the thing that I, the most salient thing I remember you saying was, uh, what led me to become a, a, a student of the Enneagram. And that is, you know, how, how do you know what kind of person you're dealing with on the other end of the phone or in an, in an interaction? And I have historically been, uh, ha have had a very poor level of curiosity about that. Um, so what that impetus, although it took a few years for it to, to fully come to it, to fruition, eventually I just, I didn't have a choice. I'm like, I have to learn this. And, and then, you know, so that makes me think of just, I don't know that you were at that place in your career yet, but I'm starting to connect the dots because this, this had become a point of fascination for you too, was understanding, okay, I know this person, but why are they that way? Yes. And, and probably at the time it was a little more self-centered. I want to know why I'm the way that I am. Um, the process of writing this book though, was really interesting because I found a lot of things that my father wrote about his family. He wrote extensively about his time in the Marine Corps, and that's all in the book. I, I went back to old journals that I had to keep when I was in high school. And so I don't have to try to remember what was it like. I literally read the words like the, the day that my parents had the final blow up and they're screaming and yelling and things are breaking. And I have what I literally wrote that morning about, you know, my dad needs to be careful. He's a lot bigger than my mom. He might rip her head off one day. Well, I didn't realize at the time that he had been physically abusive with her. Mm. And, and yet, so I've got these firsthand accounts from me. I've got these firsthand accounts from, from my father. And, and what I saw was patterns in the family repeating itself. And so my dad's father was alcoholic and, and was abusive towards my grandmother. And my dad wrote that he was so drunkenly abusive one time, his father, that he told him he would effing kill him if he laid a hand on mom. And then my dad kind of became that guy. He didn't, he didn't have a drinking problem, but he was definitely dealing with PTSD at a time when people weren't talking about it. And, and so all those things that he, that he saw in his father that he disdained about his treatment to his mother, he started becoming that guy towards my mom. And, and I saw other things that were patterns and, and I just, I made a choice. I'm not going to be that person. Um, so with our daughter, uh, just made some really conscious choices to do things differently. And she's turned out to be an awesome person. I, I know that when my wife and I leave this world, it's better off because she's got the best parts of us and we made conscious choices. Um, so that was, that was really interesting to, to, to really not just think about, but to write a book, you've got to dive in deep and you got to think about these things and, and seeing his own writing and, and reflecting on my writing and, and all that, it was very, it was a great process. I would encourage anybody, boy, if you've got any, any time to do something like this, even if you're not going to publish it, just to, to understand yourself and your family and, and how it's impacting the people around you. Mm. I believe it's John Maxwell who talks about the idea that uh, you know, the old saying that, uh, um, experience is the best teacher is a bit incomplete because there's all sorts of people who are experienced and have not learned anything, it seems. And, and he completes it and says it's evaluated experience is the best teacher. And it sounds like this process of evaluating your past and your experiences and your father's experiences, uh, was healing for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious it, as you uncovered all of these things, uh, and decided to write them, how did you decide what to include, what to exclude, and who did you include in that evaluation process as you wrote? So obviously I included my wife because nobody knows me better than her. And so we would yeah. read parts of it together or I have a, an app where I could pull the book in and we could listen to parts and she would ask me questions. I had a number of trusted friends um, and, and a number who served in the, in the military. And so I would send it to them and I would ask them for, for their feedback. Um, it was really hard on my stepmom when she read the first draft, because she said, I had no idea about any of these things about your dad. I never saw that side of him at all, which on the one hand was great because he had changed. And, yeah. and one of the things that caused the demise of my parents' uh, marriage 
did not come into play in in his marriage to Joe. And they were happily married for 38 years until the time of his passing. So I was, you know, I felt bad for her that she, you know, saw this side, but, but it's so interesting how things are then explained because I remember she said, she goes, I once said to your dad when I would see old pictures and, and how much fun his brothers were, she said, I wish I knew you when you were younger. And he, and she said, he just matter of factly said, no, you don't. Yeah. He just, he, in the same way though, that he didn't want to go there with me, he, he didn't go there with her. So when I questioned him about why did you hit mom? Um, he never talked to that, uh, about that with, with Joe, his, his wife. Um, and it's interesting that I got a text or an email from, uh, one of his living brothers this week. And, and he just was like, we had no idea. He said, yeah. uh, we just saw that he came home from the war. And his career took off and we thought, man, he's unaffected by this. And he goes, but you know, we were 4,000 miles away because we lived in New York and you guys were in California. So we had no idea any of this was going on. And, um, and I can understand why he didn't want to revisit it is painful. I mean, yeah. at one point when he got remarried and, and I write in the book that a good friend of his came down to where I was going to school, Miami university, which is a couple hours away from Columbus. And when Gigi picked me up and was driving me um, back to Columbus because I didn't have a car, and she said, you know, your dad is really happy that you're coming to the wedding, and he doesn't take this lightly. In fact, she said, last night when we were having a conversation, he asked if I thought he was going to go to hell. So he, he did stuff that he knew was, was pretty bad, and, and I don't know, you know, the extent of everything that, you know, that went on in Vietnam, although he did write about it and there's some really wonderful things. That he did. Um, but, but he, I can understand why he did not want to revisit that stuff. But, you know, as I say in the book, that's, that's the person I needed to know. Um, and to be able to give grace to somebody and forgive them. Yeah. Um, I, never, I never got to utter the words, I forgive you, but we reconciled our relationship and we would enjoy being around each other. Um, that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't fought through what we had to fight through. Yeah. I, I know that um, sometimes facing the reality of one's experiences can be tremendously difficult, painful, scary. And so we don't tend to do that ourselves, not willingly. Mm -hmm. most of the time. Uh, and yet when we face those, we have the opportunity to heal from them mm -hmm. in ways that, uh, you know, just walking away from them is a bit incomplete. And it sounds to me like you took the step that he was unable to take of uncovering and exposing the mm -hmm. harsh reality of his life and his experiences and how those affected him and you and other family members and probably friends and acquaintances. I'm, I'm curious when, when you began to float this book to other folks and, and bring them into this process of healing, what sort of reaction response did you get? Um, well, I will tell you, and not that I was sharing it with our daughter, uh, who's an adult, she's 28, married now. Uh, I didn't share preview, but I gave her the book as soon as I got an author copy and, and, uh, she read it in a day and we had lunch the next day. And I said, so what did you think of the book? And, um, she said she cried and I said, uh, would you have cried if it wasn't me? And she said, yeah, I, I think I still would have, but I think for her to think of me as a kid and the stuff that was going on and the impact and, and as an adult, the hard conversations, it, it hurt her to, oh. to think about that. Um, you know, I had other people who, when they read it and they're just like, wow, you know, I had no idea. And, and sometimes I was like taken back by that. Like, I'm like, what do you mean? And, and like, man, I, how did you turn out as well as you did with what you went through? And I'm like, I don't know. That was just my life. To me, that was normal. To me, it was, I don't know. It didn't weird me out seeing my dad on the sidelines of a high school football game with 
the lady that he was living with while he was married to my mom. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just a high school kid. I'm like, ah, I'm focused on the game. I'm going out with my girlfriend afterwards. And, and so, so much of that stuff gets buried. Um, but again, you start looking back and going, why am I the way I am? And, and yeah. there's no way, there's no way you go through that and are unaffected. And when I hear people say things like, um, oh, you know, you know, the divorce, but the kids are doing great. I'm like, you have no clue. Yeah. They, 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 they may be getting good grades still, and they might not be involved in, in something that's really bad, but you have no clue the questions that they're going through. They don't even probably have that clue. It's not until time passes. And I will give you one example from, from the book. When I was a junior in high school, and I was in a library and and uh, I was talking to somebody in the library and confronted me and and said, you know, told me to stop talking. And of course, you know, I said something back. And then she said, hey, look, all you did yesterday was talk. Of course, I'm going to defend myself. Well, yeah, but I was talking to a teacher. It was Mr. Bash. And so 17 years old, full of hormones and whatever, you're not going to let this go. And, and so we had some back and forth. And she finally goes, look, if you don't like it, leave. And I stood up and I go, fine, I don't give a damn. I'm going to get the hell out of here loud enough for everybody to hear. And I stormed out and she went out the other door and she got hold of me and took me to an office. And to her credit, she gave me every opportunity to apologize. And I wouldn't because I was so angry. Now, if you would have told me at 17, hey, I think this has to do with your parents. I would have said the heck it does. She's just a, and I would have ripped on her. I had no clue about how that stuff was affecting me. But all of a sudden when it did, it would just burst forth. And, yeah. uh, and then on the positive side, I've told that story to our daughter when she was younger. And I think it helped her have grace for people who, when she was in high school are acting like idiots and, and she was able to think, well, you know what, maybe they've got stuff going on at home. Yeah. There's, there's the uh, saying, be kind to everyone for everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Yeah. And true. I, I really like what you talk about that, that as a young individual, and even as an old individual, sometimes things are affecting us and we are unaware of them as well. And I, I, um, I guess I applaud your courage to put a story like this out there because I look at it as, um, inviting people to rake the pond, you know, ponds sit, they tend to stagnate, the crap falls to the bottom and it's not until you rake it up that that the, that that pond that seems clear is actually full of all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's an opportunity then to go about figuring out what belongs in the pond and what can be taken out. But one wouldn't even know it's there until, mm -hmm. uh, until there's some activity. And it seems that this book is, is an activity that a person can, can draw from to invite questions to expose things that they might be unaware of and, and ways that they might be affected by tragedy or, or difficulty or struggle or pain. I think if it causes anybody to think about things they've been through and to start to wonder how has that affected me, um, that can be a really good thing. I, I will say that I, I minimized what I wrote about my mom in the book out of respect for her. Um, she never forgave my dad. and. Unfortunately, whenever things would come up, I mean, if you met my mom just out on the street, you'd say, what a nice person, she's wonderful. But whenever anything came up about my father or now that he's passed my stepmother, it just got really intense. And, and it's so clear that the, the bottom of the pond is coming up and no. she never dealt with it. Um, it becomes it, just something that's, it's, I'll tell you, we've, we've only talked twice now in almost two years. Because I got tired of being the brunt of, of her anger because I carry his name and I look kind of like him and, and, uh, and yet she hasn't resolved these things. And I just had to separate myself and say, mom, until you get help, until you learn how to forgive, um, and it's not even for him, he's gone. It's for you to be released, but I can't continue to be, you know, take all of this from you. I've already dealt with it with him and I'm dealing with it with you and, um, but I love my mom and I, and I don't want to poke her in any way. So I'm always very conscious about how I'm promoting the book because um, she's out on social media too. And um, she hasn't read it. Um, 
I would love it if she did, but it would just, I think it would just inflame her because the, the wounds that she had from, from that marriage, um, haven't been dealt with. And so they're still there. And, and every time they get poked, it's, it's not pretty. Yeah. The other thing that's, uh, bubbling up for me hearing all this, Brian, is the, the memory of my dad, who was not a military veteran, I'm the military veteran son, but, uh, but he was, you know, he was impacted at a young age by being born into, you know, he was born during the blitz in London. Uh, and my grandparents were married, but my, my grandfather had stayed in Nigeria to serve the British company that was uh, producing food for for the homeland because the British were starving. And, um, so he didn't meet his de my grandfather for until he was two or three years old. And, um, and then he went through the English boarding school system, which is infamous for its brutality and, um, cold bloodedness <laughs> among young teenage male prefects and, you know, little boys coming in there. And he just had, uh, there were hot button things for him, you know, the, the swamp, the, not the swamp, but the, uh, the pond bubbling up and getting all muddy. And, um, it took me a long time. In fact, it was, it was just a few years before he died that I was able to start saying, you know what? He was just doing the best he could with what he knew how to do. And he didn't have the, the fortune that I've had to be around the people I've had who've helped me overcome most of what I've overcome now. But even in, even in that, I, you know, even in hearing your story, I have to realize that now there's some stuff that I'm just like, shoot, I've been doing that for years and I didn't even realize, I, I can't fathom the impact that it's having, but I know I got to do it differently because I can't like, I, I can't talk to my sons that way, you know? But I would encourage though, Paul, like uh, I've, since our daughter was born, just I always did things with her and just had a wonderful relationship. We would get in the car and drive to sleep in a cave somewhere. And so we were always talking. And so it was natural for us to have conversations. And, and so it was so natural to talk about this book and to talk about the ramifications of, of things. And, um, you know, any mistakes that my wife and I've made, Abigail has nothing but grace for us. And she's like, yeah. Hey, I, I had a great childhood and She's like, even if you focused more on like school, she goes, I don't think it would have made a difference. I just didn't like school, but, um, but having those conversations and I think just, you know, it would have meant the world to me if my dad would have just come to me early on and just said, Hey, I know that, uh, I screwed up a lot of things and it's I don't yeah. know how it impacted you, but I want you to know that I'm, I'm sorry. And I love you. Um, that would have meant the world and, and you have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I have used it. But I'm, you know, hearing stories like yours makes me aware in other ways of areas where I haven't. And I, and I know enough now about uh, how those things happen to say, you know, I think I've got a little bit more work to do. And um, it's not work that I really want to be doing, but yeah, it's, it's the same thing. I can bury the hatchet now or I can leave it unburied and one of them will pick it up one day. And they might not use it on me, but they might use it on somebody else who doesn't deserve it. And that's what I really can't live with is being at, you know, being at the, at the origin point of something way down the line that has nothing to do with me, but because, but I somehow played a role in instigating it. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I just think that forgiveness goes a long way. And, and having those conversations uh, with people, letting a little bit of the air out of the balloon so it doesn't burst. And uh, to be able to see patterns maybe in people and, and gracefully point them out to, to try to help them. You know, when you say, hey, you know, I love you and, and I just I need to tell you, here's what I'm seeing and I'm here to help you. Yeah. So it's a it is a, a challenging story is. One of my takeaways, Ch probably challenging to read. I'm sure it's going to hit, uh, strike certain chords with, with folks. I know 
you know, as you're unfolding your story, it strikes certain chords with, with me and my life. Uh, and you know, ways I've not, uh, ways I've failed, not lived up to my own expectations and certainly uh, other expectations of me. And, uh, I'm curious, uh, the, the intended audience for this, as you're writing, as you wrote this book, you must have thought the, here's the intended audience. And then the next step is how do I get to those people? And I'm curious what went on when you're looking at such a personal story, who's the audience and how do you intend to reach them so that they will read your book? So again, the audience, primarily Marines, uh, Marine families, uh, more widely, I'd say anybody who served, especially those who experienced combat because of PTSD. And, and then more broadly than that, I think fathers and sons, because I think even if somebody didn't serve, there is just a, a natural um, friction between fathers and sons. And I write about that, uh, included a, a blog post I wrote um, around the time of my father's death, and it was called Fathers and Sons. It's complicated because I think that, you know, as I get older, I, I'll be 60 in a few months. And you never want to say, I'm not as big as I was and strong and fast and I'm as capable and all these things. And the reality is, you're, you're not. I mean, I'm, I can't run a fraction as far as I used to or lift what I used to, but you want to believe that you can. And I think I don't have a son, but it might be hard to kind of pass the mantle and, and acknowledge that, hey, you know, you can do so many things now that I can't. I'm your old man. I'm here for your advice and things like that, but, but you're the man now. And um, especially if you're a Marine, I, that is that is not easy to to give up. So I think that that's the the circle that starts with the Marines and the families and it goes to the service and it goes to fathers and sons. And as far as how I'm trying to reach them <laughs> this week, I was sending out thousands and thousands of emails to my contact list, uh, talking about the book coming out, but I'm primarily focusing on getting it in the hands of Marines. And so I always keep copies with me. As an example, I was in, uh, California, uh, in January. And I'd been out there a year before and at a cigar shop, I met some Marines and one guy was really, we had a great conversation. I told him what the project was. Well, lo and behold, I was at the same cigar shop a year later and he was there and I gave him the book and he started reading it and I could just see the expression on his face. He was really, really liking. And mm -hmm. all the other Marines that I've given the book to have really appreciated, even if they didn't have the same types of struggles because it's their brother they're reading about. And so the number one thing I'm trying to do is get it into the hands of as many Marines as possible. And then to say, look, if this has a positive impact on you, pay it forward, buy a few copies for other people, you know, and I would like to see it growing exponentially in, in that manner. Yeah. Got a few people on my mind already to, uh, to put you in touch with for that, Brian. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, it's, um, you just never know when you bump into the right person and what that may do. And a really cool thing, a, a story in the book, my father talked about when he was in Vietnam, there was an individual who wanted time off, wanted leave because his girlfriend had come over from the States to, she was a nurse to be in Vietnam, to be close to him. My dad thought hey, anybody who's got a, a girlfriend who's going to come to Vietnam deserves time off. And, and so he gave this guy time off. Well, it was like 25 years later. And he hears the name Charlie Wilhelm and he's a four-star general in the Marines. And my dad's wondering if that's the same guy. And he reached out and contacted him. And sure enough, it was, he mm. married first. And, um, and so my dad said he had this great, um, kind of conversation reunion with him. Well, one of the Marines who did a pre-read on the book said, I know Charlie Wilhelm. And I, he goes, I used to fish with him. And I said, is he still alive? And he said, yeah, I think so. And he gave me his contact information. He wrote the foreword for the book. Oh, wow. So it was, it was really cool that this person who knew my dad in Vietnam and, and remembered him so well because of getting that time off and ultimately marrying that, that he was able to write the foreword for the book. And it was an awesome foreword. I read it and I thought he should have just written the whole book because it was just like you'd expect a, a Marine general, crisp and to the point. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like some of those, uh, happenstances these those those uh providential circumstances come upon us when we move intentionally mm -hmm. in a i'll be a little trite with this idea of a positive direction 
But on a deeper level, it seems that there's almost a cry. Um, this might seem over dramatic, but there does seem to be a cry almost from the universe towards reconciliation, mm -hmm. towards healing. And whoever picks that, whoever picks that torch up, say, I'm going to, I'm going to move towards reconciliation. I'm going to move towards healing there. It, it's, it's like the, the waypoints are already laid out. There's the person who's there for the forward. There's the person who's influential. Like I, I know on my book at the last minute, chapters were not coming together the way I wanted them to come together. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And uh, a gentleman who wanted to pick my, he, he was like, hey, can I pick your brain about doing business consulting in your area? And I was like, sure, you know. Um, we got to talking about the book. He printed out the entire book, brought it back to me and said, here's, here's where I think the chapters need to line up. And I was like, oh my gosh, totally unexpected. And, and it was, I think, uh, and I've heard this from from other folks too. It was, I think, this idea that as we move toward this wave of reconciliation and healing, that there that everything is ready. It, it's like ready to go mm -hmm. to make it happen for us. What what was what has been your experience with that? I think I think that when we start to move in a direction like that, we see things that that may have actually been there all along, just waiting for us to take advantage of. You know, not unlike I use this example a lot when I'm working with clients and I say, how many of you bought a new car in the last few years? And all the hands go up and, and you say, did you experience what I did? As soon as I bought my car and drove it off the lot, I saw it everywhere. It was like everybody in Columbus bought my car. But the reality is we know they didn't. I became aware of something that had actually been there all along. And, and as a person of faith, I believe that those opportunities that God has, those opportunities out there for us. And it's, an, it's once we get eyes to see and ears to hear that we begin to notice them and we can start to, to leverage those into the positive things like reconciliation. Yeah, because when there's a, a posture of genuine surrender to the outcomes and a ministry of reconciliation uh, coursing through our hearts and a sincere desire to serve and honor God's other children. Um, that's what has been the, at the foundation of the entire Bible from the get go. That's the whole thing that he's been trying to get, get us to see mm -hmm. all along. I'm in control of outcomes. Uh, you need to be merciful and serve and serve uh, the people I set in your path and you watch what'll happen for you when I do it. Um, if you can hang on to those things mm -hmm. and yeah, I've seen that in my own experience too. I've seen that, um, you know, genuinely confronting my own darkness, which by the way, I wanted, you know, I wanted to mention that I think one of the, one of the great services you're doing here, Brian, and, and all of our authors do this. And it's the whole point of telling stories that matter, which is our tagline is, um, you're not ignoring you're, you're praising what is good and you're not ignoring what is not good. You're, you're, you're dealing with it. You're confronting it. You're shedding light on it. You're giving, you're giving it away as a gift to people so that they can suddenly look a little bit more circumspectly at their lives than maybe they did. And they can say to themselves, just like you heard me saying, right? There's a few areas I hadn't really given much thought to, but now that you mention it, I did that too. Or something very similar to it and that's not that's unbecoming the direction i'm going with my life so that that's inconsistent it, it doesn't belong there and it's got to stop and i've got to acknowledge it and apologize for it and ask forgiveness and say you know I'm, i've been out of line talking that way i didn't think i was i wasn't paying attention i you know mm -hmm. i suppose i could have looked at it if i'd watched myself do it on camera i might have been horrified but um, but anyway, you know, that's, and that's, that's the whole thing. You're giving people hope. Well, I would, I would encourage people too, that when you, first of all, I think the more you try to control things, it's not unlike when we're at work and we're struggling, we just can't figure something out. And then we walk out in the parking lot and we've relaxed and the idea, and it just starts coming to us. Well, I think that's a metaphor for how things are when we're trying to control people in situations too. Yeah. Uh, 
it's always hard to, to know that line about, okay, how much do I need to do and confront and all these things without being controlling? But once you start doing that, and if you, by the grace of God, are, are able to make headway, the other person starts to respond. For me, that also opened me up to be really honest about, look at all the good things that I got from him. In spite of everything that went on, yeah. look at all the wonderful qualities that I got that have helped me be a better father and husband and uh, worker and, and helped me in my business and, and things. And, and so much of that goes back to things that, that my dad instilled in me. Yeah. And I wouldn't have been able to see those, I think, if I'd still been harboring anger and, and resentment. Yeah, because they're <laughs> even so, right? There was, a, you know, a good soldier has a tremendous sense of personal responsibility to do their part. And even as I think about things that I shouldn't have said to my sons, I'm also thinking about the fact that this is not the first time I've gone to them, acknowledged it, apologized for it unreservedly, asked forgiveness and, and told them, look, you don't have to forgive me for this. I'm not doing this because everything depends on it. I'm just letting you know I'm aware and I regret it and I wish I could take it back, but I can't. So next best thing I can do is apologize and ask for your forgiveness. And if you want to give it to me, that's, that's an honor. And if you don't, that's okay too. Well, with, with my dad, it was, this, this was really cool that uh, it was only about 10 days or so before he passed away and had a little text exchange. And he said, oh, by the way, I found the letter that you sent me on my 70th birthday. He said it was beautiful and it brought tears to my eyes. And I was thinking, what did I send him? I mean, because that was like eight or nine years before. So I had to go search for the, for the letter. And uh, thank God I, I kept the word file. And, um, and I had apologized in that. I said, you know, I, I wasn't able to be with him on his 70th birthday, but I, but I sent him a nice letter and, and um, talked about, you know, I never intended for you to feel like a bad person or anything, but I just needed to know answers to these things. And anyway, it was kind of a, you know, uh, I'm sorry for how I approach things, but I'm happy w with where we are. And, and it was so nice to know that in, in the weeks leading up to his unexpected passing that he read that. And that was what was on his mind about our relationship. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I want to, I want to make sure that people understand too, I and mean, we've talked about a lot of negative things too, but as I said, I think when my dad met Joe and for whatever reason, she was able to help him in a way that my mom was going to be unable to given the tangled mess that they were in that, that he did change. And at his funeral, my wife and daughter and I were, sitting uh, outside having a conversation and, and my wife asked me, she said, does it bother you? You know, all these wonderful things that people are saying, you know, your dad taking kids fishing or going out and doing this with these kids and that he wasn't that way when you were growing up. And, and I could honestly say, no, it doesn't bother me. It made me because it would have been sad if he hadn't changed, but he, but he became this person that everybody loved to be around because he was smart and he was funny and and he would take kids fishing and he would do all these things. And um, so his life was going on a very positive trajectory. And, and that I can be very, very proud of. I hope that when I leave this earth, that, that those were my best days, that people would right. say, you know what? I liked you when you were young. But boy, I like you a lot more. You're just a better human being. Yeah. I, think we, I think we all are hoping for that, for sure. I'm definitely... Uh, I won't, I won't speak for, for Jason. I'll, I'll assume on his part, but I won't speak for him. And, uh, I'll just say, you know, I'm definitely hoping for a much better second half of life than the first half. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I like how you close that out that the number one, people are holistic, holistically they're negative qualities, their positive qualities, the terrible things they've done, the amazing thing that they've done. You can't pick and choose in a person. No. You can take it all or you can take none of it. You but pulling pulling out one thing and saying, well that's the thing and I'm going to take exception with that. That has that that thing that you take exception with, we don't understand the impact that by removing that might also remove some positive quality. Uh and and also Honoring that transition, I think, takes a lot of wisdom uh, that um, 
previously in your father's life, he wasn't able, he, he wasn't yet ready to change. He didn't yet have uh, circumstances, people in his life to facilitate that change. Uh, and yet, uh, being able to look at the totality of it all, uh, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think, uh, what, what was the word Paul used earlier? Hopeful, right? There's a lot of hope in that. And I'm, and, and I guess I want to encourage people who are thinking of picking up the, your, your book to read it in that in that light uh because so many people struggle i think with very similar things and don't see hope uh mm -hmm. and yet over the course of a life you have no idea what could happen what could change if yep. you continue the conversations and if you evaluate the experiences and if you dig deep uh and whether you know whether your father could could um uh could complete his legacy it sounds like you pick it up through this book and you and you carry it forward in a, in a really positive way so uh thank you for that uh before before we hear where people could pick up that book and any closing remarks you want to make i do want to say that i'm glad you got the memo on the uh the uh uniform for today paul didn't um <laughs> I'm, Maybe he needs to go shopping. I'm not making apologies for living in Arizona. That you guys are, are are stuck up there by the Great Lakes. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> any any final words, Brian? Um, I I really hope that uh, people who are listening to this, that even if they're not within the military, that some of the family dynamics that we all struggle through that they relate to that pick it up and, and I hope that it helps you. Uh, one thing I want to say on a very positive note, you know, I told the story about the librarian and, and, um, end up getting a three day suspension for that. Didn't make national honor society. I almost got, um, demoted. I was a captain on the football team. I almost lost that. Thank God my coach had enough faith in me and he understood what was going on at home that he gave me the second chance, but I found her. <laughs> I, I, I looked her up and she's living in Florida and I called her one day and, and, and I, and I said, uh, Linda Russa. And she said, yes. And I said, this is Brian Ahern. And she goes, Oh, Brian, how are you? And, and I said, do you remember me? She's like, and, and so we talked about what happened and I apologized to her. I just let her know that at 17, I had no idea what was going on and mm -hmm. she and so much grace and she was so nice and we talked about the book and i just sent it to her and she said she got it and she's starting to read it and um and it was just nice to close that loop there that um i don't know that she was thinking about it for all those years but it was certainly something that i was not proud of and to be able to go back to her and and apologize and see the grace and to, for us to laugh and talk about those old times um, was really, really nice. And yeah. I would encourage people to that, you know, if, if you've made mistakes, take a chance. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. The vast majority of people will probably give you grace and say, it's okay. And, and you'll feel good about having restored a relationship or, or done something that might have given somebody else that, that kind of relief. So it wasn't just my dad who needed forgiveness. We all, we all need forgiveness for lots yeah. of things. Yeah. Really good word. Very well said, Bri. Um, you've, uh, you've far outdone yourself from the last interview and the last interview was great too. And that's, uh, not an easy achievement from the last time we talked. So, but, uh, grateful for you to share this book, uh, eager to promote it to our audience and, uh, and our, uh, upcoming newsletter, which is going to be coming out. Uh, we will, definitely put that in the rotation and um yeah i think uh, i think we got a mic drop moment there jason so i'm gonna say uh, farewell to our audience my name is paul edwards jason todd is my co-host brian ahern joining us to discuss his book his story my story our story available everywhere fine books are sold and we'll see you next time on the emissary authors podcast <laughs>